Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Rick Harnish. I'm the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance um, and really appreciate you joining us today to um, learn about some exciting opportunities in Wisconsin. So quick about us with the High Speed Rail Alliance is a nonprofit. We're uh, growing, supported by our members. And uh, we seek to be the most uh, knowledgeable independent source in the U.S. of what high-speed rail is, um, why we should build it, and what steps need to happen in order to make it happen. Um, and then we give people like you the information and tools you need in order to educate um, your leaders in state capitals and in uh, the U.S. capital. And clearly we're at a point where we've talked for a long time about this and we've got an opportunity to make some real changes and really get a good robust program underway. And uh, Wisconsin is one of the states that has a lot of opportunity. So that's why we're focusing on that today. Uh, first, I wanna start with, you know, um, many people in our line of work remember that there was a proposal to extend Amtrak service, uh, the very successful uh, Chicago to Milwaukee service. Uh, there was a proposal to extend that to Madison. And in fact, it was funded with federal funds uh, just over a decade ago. Um, we were all looking forward to riding those trains. And unfortunately, uh, that got caught up in a national political whirlwind where um, I think there was an organized effort to really try to kill the program overall. And you can kind of see it with Governor Christie canceling a program that was already underway to dig new tunnels under the Hudson. Um, and then the programs just kind of fell like dominoes from there. So the excellent project got caught in, uh, in a buzzsaw of other issues, uh, but we need to point out that that positions Wisconsin perhaps to be ready to go because you've already done most of the planning work needed to get to Madison. Um, and there's also in the interim been really important progress that has happened. And um, one of those has been uh, the rehabilitation of the Milwaukee train station, which is pictured here. It was a real dump. 10 years ago, and now it's an excellent place to get a train. And uh, Wisconsin has lined up the funding in order to build a freight bypass. So, so the freight trains don't have to go through it anymore. And the last time I was there in uh, September, I was looking at the train shed and saying, this is a station that begs for more trains. Uh, not only more trains to Chicago, but uh, more trains to other places. So that's exciting progress. Um, during the Governor Walker era, there was a rail plan approved that um, has a number of additions to the existing Wisconsin network. Uh, that's an important piece of progress. And I want to point out there that Superior Wisconsin is on the map. And that is a project actually that's also pretty much ready to go with the tier two environmental clearance already having been done by the state of Minnesota. And that'll feed people into the trains to Chicago, which makes them more viable. Um, another piece of progress was um, uh, two rounds of expansion on the train station at Mitchell Field. And uh, most recently, funding's been acquired in order to add a second platform uh, to that station so that uh, as part of the step towards going from seven Chicago to Milwaukee trains a day to 10 Chicago to Milwaukee trains a day. So there has been progress. Um, we need to celebrate that and find new wins that can be achieved in the next couple of years quickly. And also think about uh, long-term planning at the same time. So uh, this presentation today will have a couple of segments. The first is just for those who are new uh, to the organization, some background information so that you understand the language and the, the philosophy. Um, the second will be, um, 
a discussion of some next steps. And then the third will be uh, looking at California. And unfortunately, you know, we really have to look to foreign countries to understand what success will mean. Um, and so we will do that today and we will look at California's program in order to understand the bigger picture of what's possible in, in Wisconsin. So um, we're doing this for multiple reasons, but the essence of it is that travel is incredibly important. We are very spread out in America with our families spread out in many different cities. Our universities frequently are in different cities than the business centers in different places than the government centers. Madison's actually got all three, uh, but in the rest of the Midwest, they're more spread out than that. Our, and so the more that we can make travel possible, uh, the more that people will travel and the stronger our economic and family relationships will be. And trains make it easier to travel, safer to travel, more productive and Plus, because they are dropping people off in your town without a car, uh, they can facilitate dramatic changes in the economic vibrancy around the train stations because now you don't have to spend all that money on providing places for your visitors to store cars. You can actually have um, high productivity use in your downtown area. And most importantly, Trains have an advantage. So if the goal is to be with each other more often face-to-face, -face, you can actually be with each other face-to-face -face while you're in motion. It speeds up to 220 miles an hour, which is currently uh, the standard um, in uh, China. So um, again, first step is a little bit of our philosophy. We don't see high-speed rail as a totally separate technology. We see it as a series of building blocks that the more blocks you add, the faster you can go and the more frequent you can go. Um, uh, in the, I won't talk about these today. I'm happy to talk about them offline, but basically the key thing is high-speed trains are part of a system that grows over time, not a separate technology. Uh, to simplify the discussion, we talk about three types of track. There's more that are possible, but um, in order to keep the discussion simple, we talk about three types of track. Shared use, where preferably you're going no faster than 90 miles an hour. There will be a couple of exception, exceptions where the trains will be going 110. Um, Amtrak doesn't really work very well on shared use, but that's because the country hasn't invested in the type of track needed to run those Amtrak trains on time. Uh, but Metro does demonstrate that it can work on two lines that are incredibly busy freight lines. And also pre-COVID had 90 passenger trains a day on them. Um, and one of those is pictured on the left-hand side. So shared use lines provide the broad geographic coverage you need to serve entire regions, just not major cities. Regional lines are where a government entity takes control uh, of an existing line that perhaps is not very well used today um, and upgrades it for high frequency passenger service. A key example of this in the United States is the uh, Washington, New York, Boston, Northeast corridor, um, where trains soon will be going 160 for some segments. And then high speed lines are where you're building completely new infrastructure to go hopefully uh, 220 miles an hour, but not necessarily. Um, one thing to point out is frequently high speed trains can go on the other types of track. It's not necessarily desirable to, for them to run on shared use lines, but it is physically possible. So that um, allows you to phase in as you go. So those are the basic building blocks that we need to think about as we move forward for a Midwest regional plan that Wisconsin is a major player in. And what should be happening at this point is we should be finding quick wins where you can use shared use lines to add cities to the network and frequencies to the existing network very quickly while also planning the high speed lines 
And in some cases, they run, may run parallel. In some cases, one may replace the other. But we, I think it's very urgent that we start running a lot more trains while also thinking about a much more robust uh, system in the future. And then the other philosophy is our planning in this country is tended to be city to city. Um, and unfortunately that leaves out a big piece of the picture. So we really need to think about network plans because the more segments you add where people may be connecting or maybe riding a single train on different parts of the network, the more usage you have on each segment, which makes additional, makes it possible to invest more heavily in each segment, which means you're bringing a lot more people into the system, a lot more political support and a lot more financial support for making the system work. So we have a game changing opportunity right now which is that Congress has just way amped up the programs for building passenger rail across the country. And again, there's a longer analogy that I use to explain the process of moving a project from idea to actually being able to take the train. Um, the short of it is that Congress can put fish in the lake uh, but an agency has to really go out aggressively to fish for those fish and clean them and cook them and invite people to come and sit at the table and eat them. It's a multi-step process and you need a lot of support from the local levels in order to keep the DOT uh, motivated and able politically to move forward aggressively on this. So it's really important that there be um, a strong statewide and growing effort now in order to start thinking about what steps can happen today. How can we get planning underway for a much more robust network in the future? So that the um, pots of money that are now available, um, there are others than this, but these are the big ones. Um, about $66 billion in a one-time appropriation that can be used over five years in a variety of programs. But I also want to point out in the same bill, they authorized additional expenditures and out years. So Congress could, for 2023, appropriate even more money. Um, the 2022 budget is probably not going to be much different than the 2021. But the 2023 budget, there's an opportunity to get even more money. But we have to be thinking about how we build a coalition around asking for that and asking them for that aggressively in the spring and the summer. But um, the, the uh, programs that apply specifically to Wisconsin are the Amtrak National Network program there. So Amtrak can start with its own money, taking step towards improving services in Wisconsin if they choose to do so um, with some input and direction from the FRA, but that can happen. Um, and the greasy uh, squeaky wheel gets the grease. And then the state of good repair program is now misnamed, but it's really the expansion program that states can go after to, to add expansions. Um, Chrissy can be used for any railroad project, including freight. And then the grade crossing elimination project is something that I find very exciting because we should have an aggressive program to close grade crossings, whether it's freight or passenger, um, in order to make the system more reliable and safer overall. So there really is a new exciting opportunity to make progress. And this is the best opportunity I have seen by far in the approximately 50 years that I've been paying attention to um, why we don't have the kind of passenger trains in this country that we should. So it's an exciting opportunity to move forward. Um, some ideas to show how things are starting to kind of coalesce around a specific vision. Um, Amtrak, when they were promoting this funding, um, they were suggesting that the funding be go through Amtrak be, for various reasons. And they put out this map to discuss what they might fund if they were to get those, those projects. Um, and you can see that in their mind, Green Bay, Madison, Eau Claire um, have a significant role to play in expansion. Um, and I already mentioned the uh, Minneapolis to Duluth via Superior. 
Um, so an exciting discussion of an immediate way to get some new service started quickly. Uh, the Federal Railroad Administration started thinking about a long-term plan. Uh, they released the first phase of this planning um, this fall. Um, and to be clear, they didn't look at all about what infrastructure was needed, whether it was feasible or not. This is purely just um, creating a framework for a discussion of a high-speed rail network in the Midwest and what cities it probably should go to. So this is a longer-term vision. Um, that suggests that a new high-speed line should be built from Chicago to St. Paul with stops in Milwaukee, Madison, and elsewhere. And this would feed in the other services that I will talk about in a couple of minutes. Um, again, what we should be doing is figuring out quick starts and the long-term plan. And we need to be doing them at the same time um, and the state needs to be very aggressive in doing this. We are still um, uh, individual states working together in some cases, but in terms of uh, railroad policy, it's still very much a state-driven effort. And so we need, again, how do we create a coalition across the state, statewide, to persuade the um, legislature to fund the development of plans um, and to get much more aggressive about doing so. So I just, you know, there's a multiple ways to do this, but I wanted to have a discussion about some things that are important. So this is not a specific proposal, it's just a discussion point. Um, and so I believe um, and this is after years of experience um, and um, advocacy uh, and, and the efforts involved that if you're going to um, advocate for a new route, you need to set a floor of five trains a day. And that allows you to have an early morning business departure, a later morning uh, leisure time departure, midday, pre and post dinner is basically why that's that's the minimum that it becomes truly useful. So I just started thinking about, well, what if on the existing routes, and I'm not saying that they would be on the existing routes, probably it would be a mix, but what happens if you provide a five, day five times a day schedule from each of these three origination points into Chicago? Um, it provides an interesting little discussion point. First of all, uh, looking at Green Bay, I think the uh, perspective needs to be, let's start with the freight customers on that line and a discussion with the CN about what is needed in order to improve freight service on that line and then work at, okay, that's the baseline. We need to improve that. And while we improve that, we're also going to make it possible for five trains a day at uh, no more than 80 or 90 miles an hour. It's my idea, not necessarily the right one, but it's a, an interesting starting point. Uh, perhaps we do the same thing with St. Paul with the addition of some of the frequencies going to Eau Claire and some of them going to Madison. Again, don't know, no real study's been done yet. And similarly, going and looking at the previous work that was done on Milwaukee to Madison extension and figuring out how to do at least five trains a day out there. The interesting thing is, and I will say, I think Madison should probably have a train every two hours, which gets you to 10. Milwaukee should probably have a train to Chicago every hour. Um, but you're getting close to that um, if you look at just these five departures. But then Milwaukee to Chicago becomes an incredibly important piece of making the rest of this work. Um, and um, also, it also shows that if you could take 30 minutes out of the schedule between Milwaukee and Chicago, you've really changed the competitive picture for all of the other legs as well. Again, no planning has been done, just a starting point idea. There needs to be a consensus across the state about how this is going to start. And part of the challenge with this diagram is you do have um, a lot more stops on here than what, what's noticed, but there's parts of the state that are missing. So what's the answer there? 
Um, and the answer to how you make this a statewide program um, is illustrated in California. So in uh, 1990, they started in a very aggressive program to upgrade their shared use lines. And all of the high frequency lines in California are listed on this map in blue. So that Bakersfield to Oakland, uh, very much like a Midwestern route in terms of you look at the geography, the way the farms are laid out, the way the cities are laid out, it could be a Midwestern route. They've got eight trains a day there today. Uh, 16 trains a day on the other Amtrak routes plus frequent commuter trains on many other routes. But the other really important thing to discuss here, oh, and the orange lines are the daily Amtrak services that connect the state to the rest of the country. But the other important thing here is those yellow lines. So all of those yellow lines are bus lines where you can buy a ticket to ride those buses on Amtrak.com. Um, and the buses are timed to meet the Amtrak trains and vice versa. And you use one ticket to get anywhere in the state. So that's how the um, railroad program becomes a state program. Because if you've got more trains running and more people taking the train, that means more people will want to connect to a bus, which means you can improve the bus service across the state and start adding frequencies. Um, and if it all works as a system, then people can get anywhere in the state with, with one single ticket. So that's what California already has. And I talked about immediate improvements. So that's one immediate improvement that Wisconsin could do. Long-term planning is critical to thinking about how you're going to piece this out and phase it. And I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Um, I wanted to point out that uh, Wisconsin's already taken a big step towards this by adding three feeder buses from Green Bay. Uh, which stop in Adelpilton, Oshkosh, Fond du Lac, Milwaukee, and you can actually buy on the um, Amtrak.com site, you can actually buy a ticket from Green Bay to Appleton or Appleton to Milwaukee Airport. Um, so this is a huge step in the right direction. We need to get a lot more visibility to this so people start using it, but this is really exciting. And I'll also point out you can use Amtrak.com to buy uh, a frequent bus ticket from Madison to Chicago. So improving that system is an easy, easy win. Um, talking about the long term, California is the only state to actually have a true um, long range rail plan where they actually put together a train schedule and an implementation schedule in order to get out to the long term uh, proposal. And this is a diagram of that. This is train types are the colors. So red lines are high-speed trains. Um, and then the green and blue are other kinds of trains. If it's a red line alone, it's running on a high-speed line. If it's a red mixed with a green and a blue, it's running on a regional line. And um, the other stuff is shared use lines and then those bus lines. Um, so if you take their base year while they were doing the planning of 2010 and look at every county, um, it's interesting because by our standards, Fresno is actually a pretty busy Amtrak station. But in order to make those hoops readable on the other end, they left Fresno off and some others. But um, you can see if all of the projects that were in already in progress in California were completed by 2040, you would see a huge increase in ridership. But if you coordinate them so that you can use one ticket across them and the train schedules are, are coordinated with the bus schedules so that you can easily connect, now you've made a truly transformative impact to the entire state. And that's the critical part. And I wanna point out here that these counties up here in the North, um, they don't have train service and they're not planned to have train service. Those are bus connections. And so again, by improving rail service in one place, you have the opportunity to improve bus service um, in another place. And then they've also, because of that, they can figure out what pieces make sense to do when. Um, the, uh, they're doing a regional line between San Francisco and San Jose that's under construction. We'll be able to go out and ride that as a group in a couple of years. 
um, and they're under construction for the middle part. And because of the network, actually doing that middle part will completely transform the, uh, the entire network for the rest of the state. So every connecting service will see at least double frequencies. And a lot of them will go from um, eight frequencies a day up to um, 18. Um, and you'll cut 90 minutes out of the schedule right there in the middle. But that's why we have to do just as California did. We've got to figure out quick starts. How do we get this thing going off and get immediate benefits out there, show immediate benefits while also doing the long-term planning? It's a heavy lift, but if we start thinking on a statewide coalition basis, it's very doable. And the funding that's available for through the federal uh, program is what makes it possible now when it wasn't possible last year. Um, so one idea, again, I don't have the answers for anything. I just have ideas. I like to think they're informed ideas, but there's always many choices for doing things. This is one potential network. I want to point out I missed something important in this, which is in the state rail plan, there's a connecting bus that would link Wausau, Rhinelander, and Ironwood and some cities in between, and another that would link Eau Claire, Ice Lake and um, uh, Duluth. Uh, but again, that, especially with those two, now this makes this a statewide program. Um, and you know, perhaps, um, certainly we should figure out how to get the 10 trains a day going as soon as possible. That could be a quick win. Uh, the state's been working on that for a while. We need to make that happen figure out how to get Green Bay and Madison underway. And perhaps a real easy win is to add free, um, a train or two a day between Chicago and St. Paul, uh, perhaps on a different routing through Eau Claire. I don't know, but again, we need to be thinking about a statewide effort and a statewide coalition to make it happen with a mix of immediate improvements midterm improvements and a long-term plan. And to figure out the phasing, you have to really think about a long-term plan. So that's a quick overview. Um, I hope I didn't go too fast or skip anything important or go too long, but I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, Bill Porter um, asked when uh, the new Midwest passenger cars are due to enter uh, revenue service. And I'm gonna tell you, I wish I had an answer. Um, one of the things we need to do is, is start putting some more pressure on the states to get those things running. Um, uh, Matt, we don't have, uh, at this point, pro-rail supporters. I'm sure that they exist. Um, certainly, um, the rail department in uh, the Wisconsin Department of Transportation has been an extreme supporter and we should celebrate the work that they've done. Uh, so Bradley, would it be possible if the North Coast Hiawatha returns that that run could go on a different route, perhaps via Eau Claire and Madison? That's one possibility. Again, the state needs to be involved in, just in deciding how that works. Um, uh, David, I'm sorry that I don't have a question to your, an answer to your question about um, who's leading the discussions on rail in the legislature, but we, uh, we do have some partners who are working on that. I'm sorry that they're not here right now. And then Johnny is asking why the trains wouldn't just go, the additional trains to St. Paul wouldn't just go through Madison. Um, that certainly makes sense. Um, I just did it as a, a thought, a thought piece, not as an actual proposal. Um, no. <laughs> Phil, thank you for emphasizing a very important point. Uh, the second train a day to Minneapolis, St. Paul is um, the funding is all lined up for that and is expected to run in the next couple of years. So again, another um, uh, win that we can celebrate right now. Um, and Mark is saying that the hang up with 
getting 10 trains a day from Wisconsin to Illinois in Wisconsin. Um, and um, uh, certainly that has been true. And uh, there are ways, they're working on, on ways to get around that problem. Um, and I, I think we need to figure that out as the states need to work on with the CP very cooperatively. And I wanna point out, CP has been a very good partner in that. Um, and hopefully they can come to the solution very soon. Um, uh, Arnold on the existing Empire Builder route is not proposed for Madison. Um, Roger Huff is asking about the study that uh, Minnesota DOT did on adding frequency between Chicago and Minneapolis, St. Paul that resulted in the funding for the second train a day up to St. Paul. So again, um, progress. Um, and uh, Gretchen, we can send, uh, if anybody wants a uh, presentation to a different group, as Gretchen is asking for, uh, send us an email through the contact form on the website or um, uh, the easiest one to remember is rick, R-I-C-K, at hsrail.org. Um, and Bill Porter is asking, would the UP, uh, UP Eau Claire route be the Union Pacific? Um, and yes, it would be. And I know that there have been discussions. I don't know what the results of those have been. Um, and Johnny is asking, have there been talks about increasing the speed of the current trains between Wisconsin and Illinois, uh, Milwaukee to Chicago? Uh, there has been done work done on that. Um, I think it should be a priority, uh, but it isn't uh, funded at this point. Um, so are, are there any more questions? Um, I'll go over to the chat. So Troy is asking, how critical is it for Madison to move quickly on station selection? Um, I think that's something that you need to can come to a consensus very quickly. Um, need to really be clear through a very public discussion. And it's very, very important that there be public buy-in to whatever is decided. Be very clear on what the goals are for where, what the station needs to accomplish. That's the first thing that needs to happen in order to better um, lead the discussion or, or inform the discussion about where to put the station. There are several decent choices, uh, but um, that does need to happen quickly um, and, and come to a conclusion quickly. A consensus was the word I meant to use. Um, and Frank is pointing out very correctly that Wisconsin needs better connections through trains in Chicago. Um, that is absolutely true. That's part of that network discussion I talked about earlier. And the more frequent services on any route leads to better connections. Uh, so we should be talking about much more uh, frequent service on all of the routes that serve Chicago. Um, and Frank is pointing out that the Kenosha to, uh, the Kenosha to Milwaukee proposal for running passenger trains there is both a very good idea. And possibly you have the 10 trains a day running on the existing route. And then anything above 10 trains a day goes on the Union Pacific route along the lake. That's one possibility. Again, it's not a definite proposal, just an idea. Um, and Christian is asking a very important, are there things we can do immediately to help generate attention and discussion? So one is we can give a proposal uh, virtually um, anywhere in the state um, and we can be very flexible on timing. And uh, with a little bit more planning, 
Uh, Chris can give presentations um, uh, within a reasonable distance of, of Madison. That's one first step. The other first step is to make it, make it clear with your representatives in Wisconsin that trains are very important to your community, even if you're just on a connecting service, or maybe you need to drive 30 miles to the train station, your representative in, West, in Madison needs to hear from you about the urgency of getting this done. Um, and Frank is pointing out that the use of DMUs would make splitting and joining trains easier. Um, it would also make the providing the service less expensive because DMUs are less expensive to operate. Um, and uh, there's an excellent example of this type of train that you can go ride today between uh, Fort Worth and um, DFW Airport. That's set up for short distance uh, regional service, but there are versions of trains like that in Europe that you know go for two or three hours, just like, um, or even further, just like a Chicago to Green Bay train would. Um, and then because those couplers, they use European style couplers and they have, you know, for emergency use, they have, uh, they do have ways to connect them to freight locomotives for emergency use. But because of the European style couplers, you can actually connect them and, and unconnect them in a matter of five minutes. So in this case, you know, maybe um, you've got a train from Green Bay and a train from Madison meeting at Milwaukee at the same time and then going to Milwaukee, uh, Chicago as a single train. So a very good point. Um, and Jeff, you're right. Um, uh, there is the potential for high-speed rail between um, uh, on the Eau Claire route. Uh, that is absolutely a fact. Um, and um, I've never figured out well how to point out that there are options. Um, but again, it's not my choice. It's, it's the, uh, the, the coalition in the state needs to work with the state government to figure out what the best thing to do is. And we talked about adding uh, trains on the existing UP route. Um, very importantly, those connecting buses are actually uh, in California and other places around the country and in Wisconsin. They are actually run by private companies and either the state or Amtrak um, uh, provides that contract and some additional funding and run in order to run more frequent service. Um, and uh, Madison may or may not be a quick run as Gary is pointing out, but um, certainly uh, the Madison community should be working aggressively to figure out how to get that going as soon as possible. Um, Larry is asking how close to the Midwest region uh, rail plan that the FRA put out um, are these three proposals. They all line up incredibly well. Um, and the Midwest Regional Rail Plan, again, did not talk about the specifics, just about connecting major markets. Um, so they have not decided routing or intermediate stops or anything. Again, that's a process that will be driven by the state. And thank you, Joyce, for pointing out some important groups to link with. Um, we don't know for sure how much federal support is needed because uh, these, uh, the state hasn't put forward uh, uh, formal proposals yet, so we don't know. Um, and um, Chris is pointing out that we should thank the municipal facility, uh, <laughs> municipal officers and chambers of commerce who have joined us and at least one reporter. So thank you all for, uh, for sticking with us. Um, and Bill is um, asking if the 
current state rail plan addresses high speed rail, it does not. Um, I want to point out that Wisconsin's in the process of doing its next revision on the statewide plan. Um, there will be a public comment period um, early in the year. And it's very important that we have people from throughout the state um, asking for uh, better service. Um, and then Barry is talking about a statewide commission or compact like the Southeast has created. Actually, we did that a long time ago. So the Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Commission is a multi-state government entity that in coordination with the states can facilitate these services that go across state lines. And in fact, they were the lead actually on the Federal Railroad Administration um, framework that was created. Uh, so again, an asset that we need to celebrate um, and work closely with uh, to move these forward. Um, and Arnold is asking if Amtrak currently runs service between same city pairs with different routings um, in between, and yes, they do on the East Coast between um, uh, uh, New York and, and Florida. And um, um, Joyce, you're absolutely right. Um, I, I think we have long passed the time that adding highway capacity adds value. Um, I think we're at the point where it starts to cost a lot more than you gain in value. Um, and so, yes. Let's talk to the state about doing frequent service instead of expanding 94 yet again. Um, and Fred is talking about having the class ones run Amtrak on time. Uh, that is a big picture question. And I think that's one of the core questions is, how do we make passenger trains look like a good business to the freight railroads, right? So highways are built with public money, lots of subsidies going in there. Um, there's no direct connection to between whether somebody drives on a specific road and whether that gas tax goes into that road or not. Certainly there's a lot more money going into that road than just gas tax money. Um, but highway contractors make a lot of profit on building highways. And defense contractors make a lot of profit on public money building weapons. Right. So I think it's perfectly OK for the class one railroads to make money running passenger trains. And we need to figure out how to make that happen. And that is when the passenger trains will run on time. And I will add, it will also make freight service work a lot better and take trucks off the road as well. Um, there's a question, do you see any potential for a private company like Brightline um, to uh, run in Wisconsin? Under the right circumstances, yes, um, but the state needs to be involved in putting those circumstances together. And uh, certainly there will be public money involved and definitely public planning. So for example, in Florida, the reason that there was right of way in a station location at the Orlando airport and right all the way alongside the expressway where they're, they're building the tracks right now is because there was a Florida state high-speed rail plan put together in the 90s. So if it weren't for that Florida planning, the Brightline project would be a lot harder to do. Um, we really need to get the states involved in thinking about those kinds of things. Um, physically, it is possible for trains to run into Illinois from Wisconsin. That is absolutely true. 
Uh, so it should be possible to take a train from Milwaukee to St. Louis or Detroit on a single C ride. That is absolutely a fact. Um, the problem is they want to keep the uh, on time dependent reliability that is shining on Chicago to Milwaukee. Um, and if you connected them to St. Louis and Detroit, that would go by the wayside very quickly. Um, and Johnny is asking if we have any uh, resistance to these expansion plans. Um, and certainly, um, I don't think yet that 100% of Americans think that Americans should be able to ride passenger trains. There's still a lot of people who think that economic success is tied to individuals um, risking their lives every day in their individual cars. Um, and there are folks who don't believe that uh, highways are subsidized or that are the other problems that go along with them. And so they wonder why we would put public money into trains. And those groups are still there. They will always be there. Our role is to find the people who want this and help them communicate with Madison more frequently. Any more? Again, thank you to everybody for coming. If there's, oh, wait, I see. Um, um, I'm not sure, you know, certainly in the study of a potential corridor, you do need to take modal diversion in. And I hope these trains will be robust enough that we can start to divert a lot of car trips. Um, And then Barry is pointing out that if the state built the infrastructure between St. Paul and Chicago for the high-speed line, um, that it's likely that private operators would be able to operate on that in an operating surplus. And um, I believe that to be true as well. Um, and I think that uh, part of the key to making passenger trains work across the country is putting double track back in uh, where it was taken out. And in some cases, putting double track in where it wasn't before and sidings and other things like that. Um, so lots of good questions. Uh, there's a something since we've got a little bit of time. Again, just a think piece, not a specific proposal. Um, but part of the challenge, the figuring out how to add more frequent service between Chicago and Milwaukee, is that. Um, the assumption has always been that all Milwaukee trains have to go into Union Station. Um, and I would just like for us to think outside the box in that regard. And um, I would like to point out that if you take the current terminals of um, at O'Hare, this is just the terminals. I want to point out that there's an automated streetcar line called a people mover because you can't have streetcars now in these days, right? It's got to be called a people mover that comes around and it serves terminal one, two, three. And it goes all the way up to the uh, really giant big parking garage and bus station that they built up in the Northeast corner, which is also where the Metro service is. Um, that would be like having that streetcar go up to um, essentially Han Hancock Center, right? So I just want to think in terms of that scale first to show you how uh, unproductive airports are on land, but also to point out that Union Station and Ogilvie are incredibly close to each other. Um, so if you could um, build a 
weather protected walkway between those two, which is physically possible, it now becomes possible to use those stations as one unified station instead of two stations. So conceivably, again, just an idea, but imagine there's, it's a little, not quite as easy as this, but imagine if you were standing in the Great Hall at Union Station and you're looking at the train departure board and the three o'clock train is um, going to be departing from Milwaukee from track N, so north end of Union Station, N21, but then the four o'clock train is departing from track O16. Um, and because those stations are now connected with a, a weatherproof walkway that's attractive um, and they're very close together, that becomes a very reasonable thing to think about doing. Um, so that breaks free from the idea that all trains have to go into Union Station. Uh, again, just a thought piece. Um, and uh, Chris has pointed out that uh, we do have a petition if you haven't signed it, um, where you can join our email list. And um, one more question. Johnny's asking about um, how Amtrak is uh, prioritizing its projects. Um, and um, actually they haven't, and the Federal Railroad Administration is going to play a huge role in that over the next six months. So what we really need to have happen is the entire country needs to rise up and say, make my service first, right? And if they do that in the next six months, if everybody says, I want trains now, and that total number is $120 billion, then next summer, when we're talking about how much money Congress is gonna appropriate for 2023, it's a lot easier to build a case for appropriating a lot more than they're planning on now in 2023. So that's an excellent question, Johnny. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, Uh, so thank you again for joining us. Um, we've got the need to ramp up our staff uh, dramatically. Um, so uh, uh, because, you know, as we said, there's a lot of people who need to get engaged and be informed. Um, and we need to inform a lot of people. And uh, you can play a huge role and getting the word out about this exciting opportunity by going to our website, highspeedrail.us and um, clicking the donate button. Um, and if you liked this program, you know, if this had been a luncheon, you would have paid $25 for it. Uh, maybe make a, a $25 donation to pay for the program. If you wanna help uh, uh, get, um, uh, more happening, you can make it bigger. And if you'd like a more behind scenes on what's happening with our plans, if you make a donation of 250 or more, we'll send you a link on how you can join an in-depth discussion in the very near future. Um, so highspeedrail.us is the website. Uh, please feel free to contact us through the website or make a donation and take action with the petition. Um, and let me just double check to make sure we didn't miss anything. Again, thank you again for joining us, highspeedrail.us.